Okay, back in early 1999, actually around uh, early March of 99, I got a dog and her name is Claire. And I love that dog. It was the first pet I ever had, the first dog I've ever had. Uh, growing up, my, my parents weren't big on pets for various reasons. And uh, I'd always wanted a dog or, <laughs> you know, it's defect, maybe a cat, you know, any kind of pet, but I never got one. And so finally in 99, in early 99, I just turned uh, 31 and I got myself a dog. Her name was Claire. I don't know why I called her that. It just sort of like uh, occurred to me as I was uh, going back home from the um, North Shore Animal League where I'd gotten her. I was living in Manhattan at the time. And uh, as I was going home with her, I decided I'd call her Claire and uh, that was her name. And I had her for 15 years. She was a great dog and she passed away in um, early 2014. So she lived with me for 15 years. I got her when she was a nine week old puppy and except for those nine weeks, she lived with me her entire life. And uh, she was a good dog, and I miss her very much. And the thing is, see, the, a pet will provide companionship, of course, but uh, a, a pet can actually teach you a lot about yourself, about being a human being. Okay, it, it's kind of weird, but to tell you the truth, I learned more from the dog than from just about any professor I ever had. Let me explain. See, I noticed it early on when she was just a puppy. I, I had a place in Lower Manhattan and I'd walk around with her, you know, and when she had to go and do her business, right? I'd walk around with her, you know, I'd do a little circuit from where I lived on Pearl Street. Uh, I'd go around Water Street up to Wall Street and then over to Broadway and then down Broadway to Pearl Street and then back home to my loft, right? And along the way, there was, you know, there were other people, there was traffic and what have you. And I remember very clearly when she was just a little puppy, okay? I mean, I couldn't have had her more than a, a, a couple of weeks or a few weeks. And a car backfired. And it made a loud noise, of course, like a gunshot, right? And I jumped. And the dog jumped, of course, right? And then the dog, you know, when we realized that nothing was going on, the dog looked at me, okay? Now, I had her on a leash, and, and she was constantly pulling on the leash. She just wanted to go, and, and I think that she just didn't like the idea of being on a leash because when I finally got her off the leash, she never ran away. She was always right next to me, but she didn't like the idea of being on a leash, which is <laughs> kind of funny because that's been my problem all my life. But anyway, um, she turned and looked at me with this expression, and I'll never forget it. You know, she, she, she turned and looked over her shoulder at me and locked eyes with me when the car backfired. As if to say, did you see that? Did you hear that? Did you notice that? As if to confirm that the reality that the dog had perceived was the same reality I had perceived. You know, I was really kind of interesting because I started to realize that so many of the things that we do as human beings, we sort of like say things to one another and, and give each other certain looks because we're confirming the reality around us, right? And and that's not a human being thing. It's it's a being alive thing. It's, it's you know, it happens with the dog. And I started noticing it with other animals, of course, that whenever an event happens in their environment, they sort of like glance at one another, irrespective of the species, right? So anyway, I was living in Lower Manhattan with the dog and I would go down to Battery Park. In Battery Park, that's where all the other uh, dog owners would hang around, right? And there wasn't like a delineated place. There wasn't like a, like a set uh, dog run. It was just like, like, like a piece of grass there in Battery Park. But people would let their dogs off a leash there and the dogs would run around and play and stuff like that. And the owners would, you know, mingle and socialize. People, most of the people there worked in the, um, you know, on Wall Street or were attached somehow to the financial district. And anyway, I got to know a lot of the owners, nice people, you know, I mean, most dog owners, pet owners, you know, they, they tend to be sort of chill because the dog chills them out. But anyway, the point is, see, I took my dog as soon as I had her, and she was, like I said, nine weeks old, I would take her to the dog park 
because I'd been told that because she was so small, because she was still a puppy, that she shouldn't be with other dogs because the other dogs might bully her or this or that or the other, or she might get some disease or some shit like that, all kinds of crazy ass shit. And I figured to myself, ah, nothing's gonna happen to the dog, you know? I mean, uh, you know, what's the worst that can happen? Well, the worst that could happen was that some other of the dogs might eat her <laughs> because she was a tiny little puppy, right, at the time. But, uh, of course, nothing happened. I took her down and she got to playing with the other dogs and she had a great time. And uh, the other dogs would treat her like she was. She was just a puppy, okay, and very playful and a little bit annoying sometimes. And, you know, the way puppies are. She'd run around, she'd go here, she'd go there, all the rest of it. And then I started noticing these uh, dog owners, especially a, a certain kind of girl who's got like a, like, a, like a purse puppy, like a chihuahua or some shit like that, right? Like those dogs, those little yapping little shits, right? Especially owned by women. That the, the woman overprotects the dog. Overprotects the dog. And, um, and you know, doesn't socialize the dog. The, the dog, the little chihuahua that she has, that she treats like a little fucking baby, right? She never socializes the little chihuahua with other dogs. I did. I took Claire down to play with all the other dogs. And like the big Dobermans would play with her. And no problem. Uh, you know, one of her uh, best friends was this uh, dog called Vinny, who was a big Rottweiler. I mean, just mean motherfucker, right? Yeah, Vinny adored her. Yeah, he was like, like a two, three-year-old uh, Rottweiler, you know, at the peak. You know, he was a mean fucking dog. But Claire, poo, Claire could do no wrong, you know. Uh, and he'd let her chew on his ear and just like scramble on top of him and no problem. And Claire learned to socialize very well. She was never a hysterical dog. She never barked randomly or, or for no reason. Sometimes she barked and sometimes she bit. She bit a homeless guy who ripped me off <laughs> one time. She was in the car in my Land Rover and, um, and this homeless guy uh, reached in and stole some shit from my, uh, from my car while I was in a store getting cigarettes. And uh, Claire just bit him, just chewed him up, right? There's blood everywhere. I thought it was the fucking dog. Something happened to the dog because this happened when I didn't see it, right? No, the dog was perfectly fine. It was the homeless guy. He was messed up, you know? She was a cool dog. Anyway, she was totally well socialized because she had learned to play with other dogs. And yeah, a time or two, some of the, the dogs, the bigger dogs, had bullied her a little bit. And sometimes even Vinny, that Rottweiler, had, had uh, you know, yapped at her and barked at her and like put her in her place because she was being a little too annoying, right? But she was perfectly socialized. Whereas these uh, purse puppy dogs, right? These uh, chihuahuas and little, I don't know what the fuck they are, these little rat-like dogs that girls, certain kinds of girls, certain girls with a lot of money, a door for some reason. Well, those fucking dogs, right? They yap and yap and yap and, and they cannot socialize with other dogs. They're autistic. Huh? Now, it seems to me that there are a lot of guys, young guys, who are fucking autistic, right? I mean, they, they are just, you know, they, they are spurgy fucks, right? The, and the thing is, see, we're living in a society, and I talked about it before, where a lot of times our defects are reclassified as disorders. I did a video about it right here. And our defects are reclassified as disorders, and this removes the moral imperative on us to correct these deficiencies, right? Because if, if it's a deficiency, we have to fix ourselves, right? But if it's a disorder, well, what's a guy gonna do, right? Uh, you're stuck with a disorder, see? Well, in our society, uh, failure to socialize properly is so often as not called a disorder. Asperger's, right? And people say that they're on a spectrum, on the autistic spectrum, right? I call bullshit. Mm -mm. Autism is a choice, okay? Autism is a choice, it is a deficiency. It is a failure to socialize with your peers. Now, in the case of Claire and the chihuahuas and the pur purse puppies, right? Claire, you know, I. She was properly socialized. She was a properly socialized dog, and I took great care 
to socialize her with other dogs. And so she was a perfectly well-adjusted dog. Of course, she had her temper and there were certain things that she didn't like, but she was just all in all very well-adjusted. These purse puppies, right, they're not adjusted because their owners never socialize them with other dogs. And in point of fact, these owners, like I say, these kinds of like rich girl, like, you know, kind of like uh, over made up rich girls, right? Indulge the purse puppy in whatever the purse puppy wants, you know? I mean, treats and, and food and crap like that. A lot of these dogs wind up ballooning into like little, little fucking porkers, you know what I'm saying? But the point I'm trying to make is that, see, the, the purse puppy dogs, since they're never socialized, they don't know how to talk to other dogs. They don't know how to interact with other dogs, right? People are just like dogs or other mammals, really. And it's the same with these kids who are autistic. But here's the great difference between human beings and dogs. See, a dog cannot change itself. It doesn't have the self-consciousness, the self-awareness to change itself, to modify its behavior. But a human being does, see? Now, it's, it's not your fault if you're, you're poorly socialized, if you were raised like a purse puppy dog, right? And, and don't know how to interact with your peers. It's not your fault, okay? You, you were poorly brought up by a single mother or whatever the circumstances of your upbringing led to you not knowing how to socialize. It's not your fault, and I'm not saying it is. But it is your fault for failing to adapt and change yourself because you can change yourself because autism is a choice. See, you can choose to be maladapted. You can choose to be maladapted and blame everybody else except yourself and say, oh, it's the fault of society. Oh, it's the fault of my Asperger's. Oh, it's the fault of my parents. They didn't socialize me enough. They, they were to this, that, the other, you know, they indulged me too much, which I think is actually the root cause of a lot of these problems, right? They indulged me too much. Everybody else is at fault, but me, I'm scot-free because <laughs> it's not a deficiency. It's a disorder. It's autism. I'm autistic. Poor me. Fuck that. Just fuck that. Uh-uh. Fuck that. See, since you are a human being, you have this wonderful, incredible ability of introspection, of analyzing yourself, of looking at yourself and changing your behavior. See, that's the thing that human beings have that most animals do not have, which is self-control. We have the ability to control our behavior, to modify and adjust our behavior in order to flourish. Autism is a choice. Now, of course, I'm not talking about these poor people who truly are autistic. I mean, they, they are mentally challenged, severely mentally challenged. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the Spurg who is like a retard around girls. And the guy gets, you know, 1300 on his SATs, right? But he can't talk to a girl. Whose fault is it? Hmm? Oh, he can say his upbringing and his Asperger's and autism. Oh, fuck that. Fuck that right here and now? Uh-uh, no way. If he can't talk to a girl, he has to practice those social skills that will allow him to talk to a girl. If he can't fuck a girl because he can't convince her to sleep with him, well, he's got to have to fucking practice now, won't he? Nobody has a problem when you have to like practice like on the, I don't know, I mean, you, you want to get good at some interest, uh, at some instrument and you practice on the drums. Nobody has a problem saying, oh yeah, you know, I got to practice more on the drums to get good at it. Nobody has a problem with that, okay? But insofar as social skills, what? You're supposed to be like a natural and if you're not a natural, then you're autistic? No! Social skills are learned. <laughs> it's in the term, social skills, okay? You learn them from other people. And how do you learn them from other people? By practicing. If you're autistic or you think you are autistic, let me uh, tell you right now, you are not. Because if you're watching this video and you think you're autistic, true autistic people, cannot even have the ability to watch a video this far. They, they would never be able to make the connection between the metaphor I was making about Claire and purse puppies and human beings and grown men, 
They, they wouldn't be able to make that connection. You know, they'd be drooling in a corner, freaked out by the sound of my voice for crying out loud. That's true autism. You don't have that. Mm -mm. I call bullshit. If you think that you have autism <laughs> and you've got, made it so far in this video, you don't by definition. Okay. Because true autists, this is a severe condition that does not allow them to function in the world at all. If you are able to function in the world, if you're able to drive a car without any problem, get your driver's license with no problem, then any social problem that you claim to have that is autism, bullshit. You have to fix it. And so, insofar as your quote unquote autism is concerned, you have to practice it. You have to practice and look at what other people do insofar as their social skills are concerned. Look how they behave. Look what they do. Huh? Uh, you see them acting a certain way. You see them smiling. Well, mimic them. Copy them. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're learning to play the drums, right? And what do you do? You, you see some video of some really good drummer and you start copying what he's doing, right? And you don't have a problem with that, right? Of course not. You see somebody who is socially successful, copy their behavior. Fake it till you make it, baby. That's, that's a great saying because it's true. Because you can copy others, pretend to be like them, and try to copy the things that they do. And little by little, you will learn and be better at it. And you will cease being autistic and you will be socially successful. Now, why is being socially successful so important? Very simple. Because we have yet to be conquered by the AI. Because at this point in time, the only way to make it through life is by dealing with other people, understanding other people, learning what motivates them, learning what drives them, understanding them, getting along with them, interacting with them. That is the only way to survive in this world. See, we're not living in the uh, Skynet world. It's not uh, the fucking post-apocalypse with the Terminators running around and shit. Well, all we have are just flesh and blood human beings and you have to learn to interact with them. Like I said before, if you grew up and you had uh, a bad upbringing or, you know, bad, whatever the fuck that kept you from learning the necessary social skills to be successful, that sucks. And I'm not saying it doesn't suck. It does suck. Okay. But you know, some people are born without arms. That sucks too. Okay. What are you going to do? Uh, you know, you're born without arms. You're just going to be there and just not do anything and just like moan and groan like, oh, 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 poor me. I was born without arms. No, you're going to try to do something about it or at least try to lead a normal life. And see, the difference between lacking social skills and lacking arms is that, see, lacking arms is forever. Lacking social skills, you can fix that. Oh, yeah, it's very easy. Practice. Pay attention to what other people are doing, people who are socially successful. Look at what they are doing. Study them. Copy them. Nobody's going to slap you with, uh, you know, copyright infringement or some shit like that, right? Copy what they're doing. Copy them. Mimic them. Try to be like them. Don't try to be like one specific guy. Look at different people, all the people around you, okay? Sometimes you're going to notice that one guy is really good with girls, but lousy with his bosses. Sometimes you're going to notice that one guy is really good with dealing with his superiors, but can't get laid to save his life. Well, what do you do, right? You, you pick and choose and try to get the best and try to create something that works for you. This is no different than learning how to play the drums. There are African Bushmen who do not know how to read and write, who certainly have never even fucking seen a car who can play drums, okay? If they can do it, you can.